Nature. From the flocking birds over the savanna to the graceful gazelle dancing across the luscious plains. There is no animal more quick to reign terror in this paradise than the golden hamster. This monster takes over 1,000 human lives each. Hey everybody. We're uh, talking today about presidential leadership. What are some qualities that we look for in a president like Abe Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Some of our presidents rank much more highly with historians than others. And so today we're going to look at some of the character traits, some of the leadership qualities that we find in presidents that tend to do better than others. So the first uh, characteristics we're going to talk about here are the ones that, uh, according to our textbook, are, are probably the most significant. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, understanding the public, which seems quite uh, simple. Uh, but the reality is you have to keep in mind that most of our presidents have come from backgrounds that are not necessarily your average American background. Uh, what you might call uh, the Silver Spooners, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, even Donald Trump presently. These are, these are people that live in a, a to top 1% or at least close to it. So for them to understand what it's like to be a normal citizen in this country is not always easy. So presidents need to work to stay connected uh, to the citizens of the United States and how they're feeling about the economy and jobs and wages, etc. Now, a second point, an important one, is communication skills. In the modern era, you guys just got done watching um, a lecture and a video on communication skills and television, the media uh, that we deal with today. Presidents can't escape uh, the cameras. And so the ability, not, not just to communicate, uh, no, we're talking beyond that. Some people have a uh, just a natural ability to connect. Uh, there's a magnetism in their speeches and a charisma. Um, and that's what we're looking for in that communication skill. Ronald Reagan, the great communicator, uh, just a, a perfect example of what it means to be a president in the modern era. Now, a second one is a sense of timing. And this one's a little tricky. But the question is, when is the best time to introduce legislation so that it will be successful, so that it's going to pass through Congress without a problem? That's a tricky business. And so sense of timing comes down to just sort of an art. Uh, and presidents are, are always kind of tracking the public with polling uh, to try to figure out if the public is ready for a new idea. The uh, White House is, is literally polling every day on, on matters like that. Congress. Is Congress ready to accept a new, a new idea? Are they feeling enough pressure from the public to support a new idea? All of these things come into play. Now, an easy example. Uh, we'll take Barack Obama with Obamacare. This, this massive medical program that passed, huge legislative bill. And it took something a little bit short of magic to get that accomplished because you had to tie together so many different groups that were often conflicting. He had to deal with Republicans in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and, and it was uh, not an easy task. But Obama also knew coming into office that he had uh, an extended, what we call, honeymoon period. And if you can get things cranked through during that honeymoon period when the public is strongly on your side, you are new and exciting and, and so the public's with you, um, you can get things accomplished that otherwise you wouldn't. And so that honeymoon period Obama knew was there. It was an extended honeymoon period. Uh, and he took advantage of that time to hammer through some crucial legislation. Uh, now, once you've been in office for a while, obviously that honeymoon dies quickly because politics is politics, and you can never make the entire country happy, or at least very rarely. And so that was uh, an example of using timing to accomplish your goals. Now, openness to new ideas, uh, the fourth one on the list. Uh, what we're talking about here is a president's ability to listen. Uh, do you have good advisors? Do you listen to your advisors? Do you allow disagreement and argument? at the table when you have cabinet meetings or when your inner circle meets to discuss legislation or plans or goals or military strategy. 
Uh, presidents that tend to have an open mind about taking in other people's ideas, weighing different options before they make a decision, tend to do better than those that don't. The ability to compromise, uh, that's another one, number five. Uh, hard to believe I actually have to talk about this, but I do, because politicians, like any other human being, are, are self-interested and uh, can be tough-minded and stubborn. Uh, but the reality is, in a democracy, you need to be able to compromise to get anything done. You may not get everything you want, but if you can get some of what you want, or most of what you want, it's worth it to concede something to the other side, the ability to compromise. Finally, we have political courage. Political courage, that's a, that's a rare thing. But will a politician, in this case the president, make a decision that the public is not going to like. It's not a popular decision, but they make that decision based on the fact that they think it's best for the country or our future. Those kind of difficult decisions, the kind that can doom your political career, the, 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 the kind that can, can damage your standing with the public, uh, the kind that can prevent you from a second term, those kind of decisions are the toughest. And presidents that can make those difficult decisions knowing the fallout, that's the president you want. Thinking about you, not themselves. So those are six. Now there are some other ones listed underneath the six that we have. Um, administrative abilities, uh, social skills. Um, there's a number of, of qualities that we, we find in the, in the presidents that were successful. But these are six big ones uh, that your textbook uh, does talk about. Now, there were a couple of other side notes down at the bottom of that sheet. Uh, one of them relates to uh, what I would call the structure of how presidents like to lead. Um, and so you have a circular structure, or what's often called the wheel and spoke structure. Uh, you've got a pyramid structure, and then you have this strange-looking uh, ad hoc uh, critter. Um, now, the circular uh, would be uh, more the Kennedy uh, style, where you come into office and, and your, your uh, Oval Office door is open. In other words, if people want to talk to you, they generally have the ability to access you. Uh, that's the open door or circular style. This can be difficult. Um, it, it can be stressful because you're always talking with people. There are meetings after meetings. It's, it's busy. It, it's hectic. There's a lot of voices involved. And so this can get to you after a while. It can grow old. As a matter of fact, there are presidents like Bill Clinton who started with the circular style and slowly modified that into a more pyramid a style. Pyramid style. Now, the pyramid style um, is, is one uh, where you're at the top. You've got a couple of people that are that are clearly your, your closest advisors. These are the people you rely on for, for almost all decisions. You want to hear what they have to say. You're going to get them involved in your discussions about uh, events and, and how to manage those events. Um, after the doorkeepers, the further down the pyramid you go, the more unlikely it is you'll ever get a face-to-face -face with the president. Um, it's more likely that if you're down at the lower level, maybe like Secretary of Agriculture, hey, Mr. President, can we talk about corn for a while? It's likely you're going to be sent up the pyramid and you'll be talking to somebody else a little bit higher up in the administration, but not the president. The president is too busy for you. This is a very controlled leadership style. You're talking only to your confidants. So it's a little bit more relaxing. It's a little less uh, arduous. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's probably less appealing to the public because the, uh, this is where you get the great photo ops. Uh, not so much here. Um, we like that outgoing, extroverted president. You don't see that as much here. Um, so the public probably prefers the circular style. Um, but this really, in, in my opinion, it boils down to personality. Uh, what does a president personally like? Where are they in their comfort zone? Um, Dwight D. Eisenhower out of the military, which one do you think he chose? Of course, right? The military is structured like a pyramid. He's at the top as a general. You know, he, he admitted that it was difficult for him to get into politics because he wasn't used to people saying no. Um, and that's, uh, 
a learning curve that sometimes you have to face when you're coming out of the military, or in the case of our present president, he's coming out of a, a business scenario. He, he's run his own real estate empire, and he too, arguably, is not used to people saying no. Um, and so the, the political adjustment is a significant one, and, and having uh, political experience may, arguably makes the job easier because you understand. Uh, now, uh, the ad hoc. Uh, system is, is kind of a convoluted mess. The best way to describe it is you probably have a president that prefers a, a pyramid or, or maybe a circular style. Uh, but at the same time, they add a whole bunch of uh, new ingredients to the White House structure or the administrative structure around the White House. And that's what these are. Um, these, these ad hoc or additions to um, what, what is traditionally in place. And so, for example, uh, maybe you you're, want to deal with a, a drug crisis, uh, methamphetamine or something. Um, and so you set up a new task force that's going to look into that. And you pick your own people to be on that task force. Uh, that, that's not a normal part of the structure of the White House. As a matter of fact, you could put, uh, because you have a Department of Justice or a Health and Human Services, you, you could arguably use departments that exist. But you don't because you want this group of your own people looking into that. Uh, and then maybe you set up a new office that's uh, looking into education systems uh, throughout the country. What works, what doesn't. And, and your little group, your, your, your new committee, your task force is going to look into um, ways to improve uh, public education. Um, and, and then maybe you've got another group uh, with, with a czar, you know, a leader that's going to help uh, figure out how to manage our uh, growing uh, federal budget deficit in, in that group. Again, you, you could use Treasury, you could use people from OMB, um, but instead you create your own group of people that you know and trust uh, to look into that for you. That, that is the ad hoc uh, system. Can every president that we've ever had fit into one of these three categories? Not necessarily. Um, oftentimes you find these modified versions of either one that presidents will use um, but the, this is kind of the general look at leadership structure uh, when it comes to presidents. All right. Now, finally, uh, we should mention that historians since at least 1963 with the Schlesinger survey, Arthur Schlesinger is a famous historian who started a, a, a very intense survey of PhDs in history, people who actually know what they're talking about. Uh, in their voting uh, to rank the presidents based on their greatness, what they achieved among other things. They're, they look at a whole a pile of, of different uh, characteristics, different uh, actions, um, and they're trying to figure out who did the best in this position. Uh, and that survey has been going on since 1963. I would argue it's the best one out there. Now, there have been other surveys that have picked up since. Some are Again, sticking just to the experts, others just uh, interview the public, which are uh, disastrous uh, because we, we don't um, know what we're talking about. We remember bits and pieces from our history classes, and that, that kind of slants um, how we feel about uh, precedents. You know, why does uh, George Washington rank highly? Well, because of the cute story about chopping down a cherry tree. I mean, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's the public. Um, the historians are looking far beyond the cherry tree stories. They are going deep into a president's time in office. But uh, those rankings, we'll show you a few in just a minute. What we know from these studies is a couple of things. Great presidents have a couple of things in common. The ones that always rank in the top 10 to 15 have something in common. Um, and that would include uh, high expectations. These were driven individuals, people that were working all the time, forced the people around them to put in hours and hours. Um, and, and that is just a, a characteristic of their administrations. Uh, the, the second thing we notice is their appointments were absolutely studly. People that knew what they were doing. Your secretary of state was a foreign policy guru, somebody who you could trust with anything. Um, your, your Secretary of Defense was a military strategist with a brilliant mind. Um, your Secretary of Agriculture knew farming and, and, and how farming worked as related to corporate America and, and uh, food distribution, etc. Um, your uh, Secretary of Housing and, and uh, Urban Development um, actually understood city life and uh, had studied city planning maybe uh, for a career. You pick people that know what they're doing, you will have a better chance of succeeding. It's common sense. 
You don't have to be a brain. You can hire brains. Now, we've also got uh, fought to achieve goals. And what I mean there, we're getting kind of into popularity. Um, great presidents were not always necessarily popular at the time. Um, there is uh, no surprise that, that Abe Lincoln, for example, um, was assassinated. I mean, there were several attempts on his life. And, and imagine, it's the, the Civil War, post-Civil War era. As a result, at least half the country hated his guts, right? Um, yet, he ranks very highly uh, because he fought and achieved certain goals like holding the Union together, um, which were, were difficult goals to achieve. Lacking popularity does not mean bad, I guess is the point here. Um, the, these uh, fighters, uh, the, the, these presidents that, that, are, that are pushing, pushing, pushing to achieve goals will at times get nasty. There will be political fighting. Um, there, there will be angry public reaction. Um, but in the end, do they achieve their goals? Well, yeah, and that's the point. Um, now, finally, I should point to one thing that we know is not necessarily an important trait in a great president, and that's a surprise characteristic, but we're talking about intelligence or IQ. Great presidents do not necessarily need to be highly intelligent. Great presidents are leaders, not necessarily brains. And we have seen that time and again, historically. Some of our highest IQ presidents did not fare well in the office. Well, there are several reasons why that probably is true, but the point made here is simple. When it comes to leadership, you're looking at a different group of characteristics than when you're looking at intelligence. Um, and they don't have to correlate. Leadership is a very different thing. And some people do it well, some people do not. All right, uh, there we go. Now, hopefully that, that helps you as you go into our little exercise uh, post-lecture here. Use the notes as you go through um, some, some stories that I'm going to give you, um, and you're going to try to identify what leadership quality is being illustrated by, by each of the, the presidents that you'll see in these examples. We'll see you soon.